I am supposed to be not really uh, concluding uh, the conference uh, and the discussions that you have gone through now, uh, in the last two days, but at least uh, just to bring you up to the uh, level of the global understanding where we stand at the moment, I thought I would summarize uh, the challenges and the issues uh, of global governance and the kind of issues that will have to do with the things that you are trying to do in terms of establishing sustainability, uh, try to introduce the way we can absorb or sequester carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere and try to reduce the emission of carbon dioxide. But I would approach it more or less uh, not from the technical size, but the size of the, the global economy. Uh, I used to have uh, some friends in, uh, in Poland, uh, economist friends, and they used to tell me that, uh, well, it's funny, he's, it's, he said, uh, when Poland had socialism, we never really had social development. And now we have uh, capitalism. We don't seem to have enough capital uh, to, to work with. So another friend of mine uh, by the name of Francis Fukuyama, as you probably recall, uh, Francis probably has been here some time ago also. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, 25 years ago, was not actually the reunification of East and West Berlin. For people like myself, working in the areas of uh, international multilateral arenas, uh, international economics, for us, it, signif it signifies what Francis Fukuyama wrote a book which is called The End of History. It signifies something that my former professor, long, long ago, more than 50 years ago, when he was the first Nobel Prize winner, a Dutch economist by the name of Jan Tinbergen, what he said, the convergence of system. That the system would converge, there'd be no more history because all systems would operate on the same level, same understanding around the world. Now, it was supposed to be true towards the end of 1980s and the beginning of 1990s. But since then, we know better, and Francis is now trying to write another book to say that there is, there is another kind of uh, an annex to the end of history, that uh, we're not writing a new history. But we are making, we are trying to make capitalism, market capitalism, work for the whole world. And this is not easy, because we thought when market capitalism had a competition in terms of socialism, we thought the whole world is not actually on the same standard. And we thought that when socialism was declared uh, bankrupt, more or less, we thought, of course, the global markets would have uh, you know, had its play and everything would be resorted because the price mechanism would function. And lo and behold, I mean, in, 19, in, sorry, in 2008, 2009, we had one of the world's largest recession, what we call the Great Recession. This is, this, is, this is after 70 years of 1929-1930 recession. That has probably led to the, the, the Second World War. The 2008 and 2009 was again another wake-up call. But we are not there yet in terms of trying to make the system work for the whole economy uh, as we expect it to do. Particularly in the areas of global governance multilateralism. I work in these areas for so many years, so many decades, that I have sort of ingrained in myself that work uh, as the Cultural Diplomacy Institute uh, that you've been doing here, and the way that we can bridge all the gaps to, to collapse all the walls around the world and build so many bridges is still something that uh, we need to put in more and more effort. Because in the last couple of years, since the last Great Recession, I have seen that the process of globalization is reversing. It's not actually moving backwards, because of course with the uh, cheaper uh, prices for, for flying and, uh, and cheaper oil prices and uh, the IT communication processes around, the world, we are always connected. We would always have globalization in a way we think, we, we understand, we inform each other. 
but globalization in the way that we are trying to open up ourselves, our companies, our countries, our region, to others in the world to come in and participate. Because what we want is, uh, I think it was uh, Prince Lo Lloyd Paul who was saying that it's, the base characteristics of human beings are the same. But we have this kind of a self-protection mechanism that whenever we see new strangers, we think we have to be first a bit more aggressive so that before we understand the guys, uh, then we can become a bit more friendly. So what I'm saying here is that uh, in order to achieve what you all have been saying, and, and this is something that my former boss, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the uh, UN Secretary General, I don't know whether you've seen the, the, the news uh, a month or two ago, uh, two months ago in September. He was walking on New York Street for a few hours with Leonardo DiCaprio, of, of, you know, the, the, the actor and actresses and singers, and you know, on the streets of New York for three or four hours. This, I thought, was a practicing of cultural diplomacy in bringing people from all different culture to convince the global community that this is, this is the fight that we have to lose, the fight against the, the reduction of emission of carbon dioxide so that the global warming in the next couple of decades would be less than two degrees centigrade. We, this, is, this is a fight we are losing anyway. We would go above the two, the two degrees centigrade anyway. But can we keep it to the minimum, to close as close as possible to 2%, to, sorry, to 2 degree centigrade? Now, and they are preparing for the next meeting, next year in Paris, I think, for the UNFCCC meeting, which is the, uh, the Forum for Climate Change Negotiations, which actually have suffered from the lack of multilateral effort and agreements as the trade rounds which I have created together with uh, all our colleagues around the world at the World Trade Organization in 2001. This has been 13 years of trade negotiations in the trade round, so-called the Doha Development Agenda, that is not going to end. And in the meantime, uh, we are seeing around the world democracies suffering I wouldn't say that democracies are collapsing. It's, they're not, it's not, they're not collapsing. As, as Church has been saying, this is, this is the worst system except for the rest. You can't change from here. We, we, we're stuck with these democracies, but more and more books are being written. People are becoming more disenfranchised, disenchanted. The Arab Spring is not the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a global spring that people have actually awoken to the reality that can we trust political system? Can we trust politicians? I asked this question in Turkey because there's some fights opposition. When somebody tried to set up some, some condominium blocks in the parks, I asked this question in, in Brazil when I was in Brazil when they tried to raise the prices of bus fares and train fares. You don't like the government, the uncommon government? They said, no. Oh, you, you don't like the opposition? No, we don't like both. We don't like politicians from all sides. So it seems to me that democracies at the moment, and if you look also in, in, in European Union, I think the majority of the governments in the European Union are not really single party government that can have all the say that you can really execute all kinds of policies, reform policies, sustainable policies as they want. More or less, we are now having a lot of coalition governments around the world try to make do with a kind of difficult process to get the reform, difficult reform process across the board, legalized by the parliament, understood by the people. You look at the latest energy price uh, fall. The slump in energy prices in the last couple of months, this has been, the fall has been large, from 100 and nearly $120 a barrel to now about 78, 79, $80 a barrel nearly 20, 30% fall in the price of energy. You would say this is good, great for the global economy, no. What happens with the kind of oil politics around the world is that when oil prices come down, instead of people, governments maintaining the, 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 the retail prices of gasoline so that they can cut down on the subsidies which we've been calling for, we are calling for sustainability. It, means, it should mean also the reduction, drastic reduction in the, in the uh, energy subsidies. No, what happens around the world today is that governments try to buy more time, become more popular, 
by passing on all the reductions in oil prices around the world to the consumers. What I see as an economist is this really a blessing? Not a best, this is not a blessing, in this, it's not a blessing. It's just going to hurt the way we are now trying to fight against the force of people actually burning up more fossil fuels around the world because prices become too cheap. And governments, I've been to nearly all of the Rio conferences. Rio 1, Rio 3, Rio 2, Rio 3. The last one was a couple of years ago, 2012, I think it was uh, uh, the Rio uh, 3. And lo and behold, you would have thought that after 30 years of sustainable development, the global level of subsidies for energy, oil price subsidies, would have come down. No, it has doubled, it has tripled. This is not the world that, that, that really understands what you all are saying here in this room and you know, around this city. No, they're not understanding. In addition to all this, uh, as usual, this mal news that uh, economists like myself like to provide to, to our audiences is that if you look at democracies, major democracies like the US democracy, the last midterm election, the incumbent party, Democrats, President Obama, he lost, he was again shellacked by the huge losses in both houses. Is he going to be able to practice uh, the kind of policies of reform that he has been actually uh, committed to? I don't think so. The last two years, although they say in the US the gridlock is just a normal business in the US, many times opposition is larger than the incumbent administration, but this time we need really the countries, the large democracies, to be able to help us by the bullets. We need to decide on on, on the new global policies, on sustainability, on climate change, on the global Doha round, on global investment policies, on so many different things. But if some of the democracies are not really functioning, we would be seeing another fight in the US Congress on the, the gridlock in the areas of the cap on the fiscal uh, uh, debt, on, on the possibility of the US government can expand their borrowing so that they can keep the administration running. Again, we'll be seeing this fight, the so-called fiscal cliff that we saw begin uh, last year, it will come again, although Republicans might be saying, no, we're looking at the presidential election next time, so we're not going to, to clamp down all the administrations. But if you look at the way, not only within the US, but within EU, the question I tried to ask to the chairman of the Prada Group this morning was really the attempt that I try to understand as fellow economists like myself around the world try to understand what's happening in Europe. Why is Europe stuck in this uneven, very weak, fragile recovery? There's been no recovery in Europe since 2008. Production in Europe, total output is still below that level. Unemployment in Europe is on average 11 percent. Increase I think it's about 25%, maybe also somewhere close in 25% in Spain. Youth unemployment doubles the, the figures. How can you say this is a recovery with unemployment so high as 10%, 11%, 20%? Why in Asia? Average unemployment rate in Asia is 3%. In my own country, it's 0.3% in Thailand. We are having problems in finding people to work we have different problems in trying to have migration policies from our neighboring countries. This is the mobility of human resource, which is, I don't think you can, well, in, in, in Europe, it's just a normal process. But in Asia, it's not a normal process. But we have problems in Asia for some of the economies like Thailand, Malaysia, not finding enough people, not finding people to put to work. We have more jobs than people. This is really just uh, strange and, 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 and difficult to understand. What I'm trying to say that in Europe, you would have thought that Europe should have gone the way the UK government has gone, the US government has gone into the Japanese uh, Arb Arbonomics, the three arrows policy should have gone, which is to try to stimulate economy, not to end it just after 2009, when they said the green shoots begin to come up. You don't kill the green shoots by saying, okay, now I, I take back all the stimulus measures and let, you, let the green shoot grow, but the green shoots didn't grow. It, it didn't have the water, so it withered and, and died. 
So that's why in Europe, now this has been four, five, six years since the, uh, the, the so-called the end of the recovery, but Europe is still very much a sick man. And the other day, the European Central Bank just agreed to adopt the so-called non-conventional policies of quantitative easing, as US has been doing three times in the last six years, three times, QE3. At the time that US has announced, now we stop the QE3 because, because the level of unemployment in US, which went up to 9%, is now at the level of 5%, while the level of unemployment in Europe is still at the level of 11%. So now Europe has decided to do the QE as well. But of course, Europe is more circumspect, uh, more prudent. They're not going to buy up sovereign bonds, government bonds, because they don't want to spoil the government's discipline. So they're trying to buy what they call the cover bond, which are bonds issued by banks and corporate society. I wouldn't go into detail. But just to give you some of the ideas of why this world, which should be functioning along the line that we expect them to do, rational decision, rational uh, policies making, we're not doing that. And, and that's why uh, I do believe that uh, with us sitting around here and this Institute for Cultural Diplomacy trying to work so much so that we can get people together, explain, explain, exchange information, exchange information, make us understand what we should be doing, what we should try to convince our own government, our own people to do, so that we would have better functional, functioning globalization process and multilateralism that works. The other day, a few weeks ago, we had this World Bank meeting in Washington, D.C. My friend, uh, another friend, Christine Lacar, who used to be the French uh, finance minister, she's now the managing director of the International Monetary Fund. You know what she said? She said to the audience that I would go out in front of the U.S. Congress and do a belly dancing for you. Belly dancing by Christine Lagarde, that would be real earth-shaking news. If you would agree to pass a legislation to allow the US government to enter into the agreement from 2010 to reform the International Monetary Fund. How come the International Monetary Fund, with the quotas distributed at the largest level to the EU and the US, and the smallest quota to China and the rest of Asia and ASEAN. At a time that the growing portion shares, not only of global output, but particularly the shares of global reserves. I don't, think, I don't know whether you know that the share of global reserves, two thirds of global reserves are to be found in Asia. But this is the reverse of the kind of quote that you find in the IMF, one of the world's most important international organizations. So IMF is still more or less under the control of the US Congress. So Christine Lagarde is willing to go out and open her belly and do belly dancing in front of the Congress, US Congress, she said. If you would allow the, if you would allow the US administration to embark upon the agreement in 2010, it's been only four years that we agree to reform the IMF to reflect the sharing of responsibility so that in, 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 uh, in doing, managing global governance, we would have participation from all. I would like to end by saying that, uh, well, this is a, another, another difficult year. Next year will be even more difficult. Next year will be even more difficult. Why? Because the growth, uh, well, which you've seen in Europe, it's been adjusted downwards. In the United States, been adjusted downward, but still U.S. will grow something, maybe 2%. In Europe, it will be less than 1%, but towards the end of the year, at the end of the year, it will be less than 1%. Whether Europe will grow next year, we are sometimes, some of my friends expect the third, not double dip, but the triple dip recession in, in Europe. Even Germany this year, how can Germany uh, uh, experience a quarter with negative growth and negative export? The best economy in Europe the best run reforms in labor market, in products market, can suffer from this negative growth. It's just, it's just a puzzle to me. But next year will be a difficult one, so much so that you know, the G20 meeting that is going to take place uh, in Australia uh, some weeks from now, they're going to look at the way how collectively they can enhance the global growth together. You know G20 commands 85% of the global economy, so they want to have only 2% growth for this group. Uh, how are they going to do it? 
at the reason, I think just last week, just ended the, A, the, OPEC, the APEC meeting, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting in, in, in China, in Beijing, where President Obama went there for the first time after four years of being absent. They could not agree, but they were talking about all kinds of economic integrations involving Asia. One is a trade, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a US-Washington initiative. One is the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, uh, which is the ASEAN initiative and China initiative together with Japan and Korea and Austria, New Zealand and, and India. The third one is a new one, which hopefully the APEC leaders hope will bridge the gap between TPP and RCEP, RCEP, which is called, and I can't recall the name now, it's something like the Free Trade Area of the Asia and Pacific. It's F-T-A-A-P, something like that, which is a huge because the APEC as a group has 21 countries. And it's going to be a long, long drawn out negotiation effort to gather them all together and agree on something which is common. I would like to end by just uh, saying that uh, all these efforts outside of multilateral organization like the WTO, the World Trade Organization, outside of the UN system, uh, when we have geopolitical problems in Europe with the uh, Ukraine, which is, of course, we are seeing different walls being erected. We are seeing geopolitical problems in Asia with, uh, in the South China Sea, East China Sea. But if you bring in the kind of personal cultural relationship, like the other day in Beijing, when uh, Abe was trying to see Xi Jinping, the president of China, uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, they did at least try to use personal contacts and agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. They said, look, the Tiuyu, the Tiuyu Island in East China Sea, or the so-called Senkaku, the same island, small island, just a few hundred people, fishermen living there, but it's a bone of contention between China and Japan. They said, we can't solve it here. We haven't solved it in our history. So let's say we disagree on doing this, but we agree to talk and disagree, and we will set up at least some commission to oversee how things could be played out in a most peaceful manner. I think Asia is trying to show the way that we're treating geopolitics in a way that the rise of China and the kind of effort by the rest of the world to see what China is doing and whether they should contain China or not, this is something that should change, should change. Because the rise of China is just something that has taken place already and cannot be stopped, cannot be stopped. The more China is integrated into this process, the more there are exchanges, the more that we have trade, investment, and cultural diplomacy with China, and you know the ping pong diplomacy, long ago Nixon in the, in the days of Mao Zedong and all these things. These are things that can be done very well, and, and people in Asia understand this very, very well. You need Asia to grow. Manmohan Singh, the former Prime Minister of India, used to tell me that Asia is a global public good. Why? Because Asia accounts for half of global growth in terms of output, in terms of trade. So we are global public goods because we help. The, this is the engine. And you cannot kill this engine now because at the moment, if Europe doesn't grow, United States turn a bit inside, inwards, and being uh, deadlocked in their own policy making, Asia will not grow. China is already on a downward path. China used to grow by, on average, 10%. Now it's oh, 7, 7.5%. Seven Next year, we'll grow less than that. So again, we have to nurture all this. We need to keep people on board, and we need to be able to bring them all together. And G20 is not is not the global governance that we look at. It's the UN system that we need to do that. But the UN system has functioned better than this, and in order to make UN system function better than this, we all, you and I, and all together in this 100 and, I don't know, uh, 93 countries around the world, we all have to contribute uh, towards that kind of a, a workable global governance. Thank you very much.